All right, so we got our prototype out of the way. And then if you saw on Instagram, we went and got more tubes, bigger, larger in diameter. So we started with the two 16s that we had left over from Beauty and the Beast. And I got another 16 inch by 12 foot that came with this eight foot section. And then I got three, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> two footer, two foot diameters at 12 feet long. And then two 30 inch diameters at 18 feet long. So I'm excited. I think I started by thinking, because I was able to get these the day I did the Instagram post, and I got these two more the following day yesterday. So I had initially thought we'll have one, two, three, two footers, and one, two, three, 16 inches for a total half dozen trees, two different sizes. But then these became available. <clears throat> Sorry, lots of sawdust in here today. So now I'm thinking we'll do two two footers, call them mediums, two 16s, and call them small, and then we'll do the two 30, 30 inch diameter ones and call those larges. So we'll have six total trees. Too large, too medium, too small. We'll have this leftover piece here. We'll have some six foot long stick, uh, you know, leftovers from these large diameter tubes. And we may do something with those. Uh, but what have we done since we last spoke? To start with, I plotted this out. This is the small, I started small so that we're making, if we're making mistakes, we're not burning up just more material. Uh, I started with just laying out that 16 inch diameter tube to have a look at where that, you know, put us. And then, you know what, I think I started on this circle. So I started with a 16 inch diameter tube and then I went out to, I think this is maybe 30 inches uh, diameter circle. And then I put the eight inch hole right in the middle of the difference between the 30 inch circle and the tube. So it looks, as you can see here, if the tube was gonna be there, the wheel, uh, pot was here kind of between there and the outer edge and then I thought it's too much like a banyan tree or more of a tropical tree to have such an extreme um, curve and change in diameter from the trunk to the root ball it's uncommon um, or at least for what we're looking at here I'd like to see a little bit less so I tucked the I decided to tuck the pots where the caster wheels are into the diameter of the tree. So then we moved to this size. So I figured I'd call that the middle size. We'll put the two foot tube on that. And the two foot circle line, is, as you can see, swings through and it'll have to notch up and over the pot that the wheel is in. No problem. In fact, that three dimensional kind of intersection is actually going to make it a better connection. We'll be notched up and over and when we use construction adhesive on that seam, rather than being a one dimensional seam or two dimensional seam, excuse me, it's a three dimensional seam which helps us. And you'll see we're gonna add L brackets after that. So anyway, I started there and then immediately pivoted to, well, if we're gonna keep this as small as possible, let's go with a smaller circle. We'll show the openings for the pots notched into the base of the 16 inch um, tree diameter. And that was just a factor of, so the caster wheel footprint, we wanna keep that as large as possible. Uh, but again, it's a compromise between what it looks like from the outside and how stable it is. We can also counterweight this. So then I added these other lobes for that root ball shape, um, but they will also let me pass a weight. If I come over to the edge of the stage like this and I push a rope weight up through there like a steel brick, I can turn him on his side and he'll set edgeways in here against the two pots and against the concrete tube. He'll set like that one, two, three. <laughs> And I think I'll probably glue a piece of wood in here uh, when we're all done figuring this out. I'll make sure that there's like a little wood cleat stuck on all of these. So once you go up, turn, and set it back down, it can't kick down and try to flatten out or push out through the surface of the root ball or anything. It'll be basically locked in. And you can set them up like that. And then for storage purposes, you can come over to the edge of the stage, reach up in here, turn the brick over, and bring it down through this opening, as well as reaching into this opening, which is where I started. Uh, using it or you know in its design so that you can get to the top of the pots where the nuts on the bolts that hold the wheels are and you can take the wheels off of these so if you want to store stuff and you want to have your wheels back you want to have your rope weight back you can get that stuff out of here which is normally the last type of thinking that we're doing and then later you find out uh oh we've built something in and we can't get it back out. in fact my rolling doorways that I built years and years ago have still got steel blocks in them because I needed counterweight and I didn't didn't make it so that they could be taken out of there easily so that means uh, this is what the final pieces look like. And these are the pots that we're talking about. Um, the 
cake pans. I got them for a deal. I found a place, I got them for about 10 bucks each. And so the biggest change that I made is going with double layers. And that's so that, now we're upside down here, but the curve from the tree trunk, all the cardboard material, I wanna leave it, hang long and staple it into this angled face. All the paper finishing, I want to leave it hang long and make sure everything's really well anchored to this face. And then I can use this face and a trim router and just cleanly trim route this line when we're all just about ready to paint probably, you know, once we're done building up the bark uh, features. And it'll make a nice clean edge, which is another thing that like, the way that I intend to build these, it just would be kind of ratty and ragged and crunchy and not substantial at this edge, which it really needs to be heavy duty there. And so I did what I could by bulking this up. So if you saw the Instagram post, you saw me glue two full sheets of three quarter inch thick plywood together to make an inch and a half. And that actually used about one half of a gallon of wood glue to do it. I rolled it out with a typical paint roller and uh, threw all the bricks of steel on there. In fact, I screwed it together kind of um, all in different places to hold it down tightly while it glued. Took all the screws out today, took the weights off today, and then I kicked things off by remaking this, which I was pleased with other than it being too thin. Um, I threw it on and remade it twice in that extra thick material. You can see here where I took it away. Now I'm getting ready to move to the next size up, and so I want to take this opportunity to show you what the process looks like. I started with this, Thinking, thinking it might be, I might be so lucky as to call it the final piece. A lot, a lot of times you just can't get that lucky, which I didn't. It did end up being a piece of the process though, which is a total win. This is a pattern. So I was careful to use a router pattern for the eight inch openings because that's larger than a hole saw will do. So I jigsawed this and used the spindle sander to make it a nice smooth opening. I double checked that those pots would slide through it. And then originally here, after I plotted where I wanted these circle openings, and smaller openings that can be hole sawed, these little ones. I laid this out on here and um, routed out these three holes. And then I hole sawed these out and I went down to the wood shop here at the school and I used the disc sander on the outside and the spindle sander on these insides and the spindle sander in here a little bit. Not a lot in these two because they're pretty good, you know, these two openings, these two styles. They're good and smooth and perfect. So a lot mostly to do with the outside contour. And then I had a nice, specimen that was worth copying over into this double thick material. So where do we go from there? We made ourselves a pattern. This, this thing was a factor first in making the patterns, then the patterns help make the final pieces. So what do I do? I come over here and I stuck it down. I used the center hole because it, it never hurts to put a center hole or a center mark on this because that's information. All this pencil information is gonna be lost when we go from the pattern to the final. And a lot of times I wish to hell that I had that info on my final pieces when I'm here working because I can use it for reference. So anyway, I took the opportunity to put one screw right down through the center hole, which will go into this material, and the hole that'll be left there I'll know is in the center of this layout at least to start with. And then I put this one both on the 16 inch diameter line and on an axis line between the center line and the center line of this opening. So I know that those two holes that are left on the final piece piece are something that I can work with if I need a known point rather than just poking holes out here randomly in the middle. That stuck it down temporary. Then I went around the outside and traced it, and for kicks I traced all the openings with pencil as well. So then I'll pop it off with the screw gun briefly. And I'll set it aside. Uh, I also like to sometimes, so since this is the access with the two screws, I'll just put an X here and I'll remember that personally, and sometimes you need to leave more info than that. But I'll know that this is the clock orientation of this when I bring it back in here. It should clock around at 60 degrees and be exactly the same over and over again, but it's a little bit wonky because I'm making these by hand and I don't want to hear it. So anyway, I do a little mark so that I know how to clock it when I get here. So here I am now with the, with the piece that I want laid out in pencil. At this point, I will drill into each of the three larger holes with a spade bit just enough to get myself a jigsaw blades, uh, you know, width in there. And then I will jiggy these out, staying away from the line on the inside of it all the way around, a little bit, just a little. And then I'll jigsaw out the whole exterior. Whoops, I'm not being accurate here, but I'll just stay outside the line by about this much, you know, which is where I set. And I'm trying to be using my 
uh, construction paper theory from kindergarten class. We're not right out in the middle here. I took the first and the second. I got the two small root ball base shapes out of this double th thick stack, and I was pleased to see that I could either A, get one of these medium sizes out, or B, I could get a large size out too, I think, eventually. So that will mean that I'll need another one of these and two larges. Now, the two larges will come out of a full pair of sheets again, and, you know, so, hmm. 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 Maybe the thing to do is to abandon this and actually make the pl larger pattern. So here's an MPES. So if I were to lay out the largest root ball shape and get as far as making this pattern for it and come over here and place it on here, I would have enough to do that. And then in theory, all I'd have to do is glue two, full more, two more full sheets together and I could get one large and one medium out of it, I think. Now, number one, I can't prove that because I haven't taken a medium size out of this sheet yet. I've taken two smalls. But they do, uh, they, they do sort of live inside of a certain circular shape, so I should check that. Because otherwise I'm screwing myself into having to glue up at least another four foot by four foot, uh, another full sheet, cut it in half and glue it into a double layer to get that last full size root ball out, or that last medium. Because if I get two larges out of the other. But the other, on, the, on the other side of the coin here, if I were to just continue moving on this today, I could get this far with it. And I could get three pots with wheels mounted and sit, and I do a rabbit. I've been putting a rabbit, and that's, that's the last little thing I was going to mention. That's what's allowing me to drop this surface closer to the floor by essentially pushing, like the pot rim used to stop on this surface. Now it sits in a rabbit, and it kind of works out flush. So it's three-eighths of an inch or so closer to the floor, which I'm pretty happy with. So I can get this far today and drop these in there. And then I went around with construction adhesive on all three of them, and I've left them off the table to be down in there nice and smooth. I'll leave them overnight and dry. Now, if I keep moving here and I get that far, I'll have three to work with tomorrow that are dry, and it'll keep me moving that much better. If I pause and lay out and create a whole new pattern for the larger sized root ball, I won't get very far before I have to ditch it tonight, and I won't get this one made and glued up. So we'll have to decide. Anyway, so what's the deal with the jigsaw? You can, um, I could put this on here, screw it down like I had it, and follow it with a router pattern cutting bit, but I'm cutting all the way around that bit. I'm just, I'm cutting a trench through solid wood the whole way. It's really, really hard on these profiling bits. And this here is already a drive to Rockler woodworking scenario because the Ace Hardware franchises and Lowe's and Home Depot, they don't carry anything like this. Half inch shank, three quarter inch, two inch depth of cut. Uh, this is like a 60 or $70 bit. Um, but this is what we're going to probably need another one to finish up. And so what am I getting at? Uh, you could cut with this, but it's really hard on it to cut through solid wood. So I'll cut most of it away with the jigsaw. And then when we're done with the jigsaw here, we'll put this back on. Like I said, we'll know because of the X uh, opening that goes in line with the screws. That it, and we'll get those screw holes. Where are they? One, two, right back together. Zoop, zoop. We'll put it right back on here where it's got a rough trim with the jigsaw. Then I can use the following bit on the router and plunge into the opening that's clear because the jigsaw took most of that material out. See, there's my, these are my, this is what you get out of there. Not that you guys can't follow this, you know, but he's right out of there. So I can just plunge router and just follow the pattern, make some really beautiful holes. I can take the center drill out of my opening, or out of my hole saw, just pop the center drill out because I won't need him, and I can just set the hole saw down into these holes in this, just to get them started to, to locate it, and then just proceed to cut those through. And then I can pop those couple screws off and pop this guy off of here and have a beautiful, smooth, following router edge to this edge that I sanded and dressed up really nice with the pattern. All these openings will be right where they should be and be nice and smooth. And this way, we will completely avoid doing this with a CNC machine, which is what you should basically do and would do professionally, um, would be to just draw this in CAD and hog this out with a router that steps down three or four times as it cuts and just makes these perfectly. We can get away without that right now, so, but someday I'd love to have the ability to do that. Although this is kind of fun, you know, it's nothing different. All this pencil work I would do in CAD and all the cutting um, might even take longer by the time you load the machine and get the software to run correctly and dicking all around. I'm pretty quick doing it this way. So the question is whether to 
start working on the largest pattern size or just bite the bullet here and make this piece out of this. Don't quite rightly know. Don't quite rightly know. What makes me think that I would be able to do a large one out of here? Because then I'd still need two mediums and another large out of the other sheet. So I don't know what I was thinking. I'm glad you guys caught that because I've caught it now. I don't know. This is the type of thinking that you want to be careful and not forget. But you can also trick yourself. It's no savings, I guess. So we'll just keep plugging away here. And we've got that gluing up and that gluing up. And then, so there's an exercise. And don't be too clever. Don't overthink it. So I've notched this one. And it'll sit right down on there. I will take some, be, you know, kind of careful to keep... I mean, it depends on where you are on the floor, whether or not it's plumb, I guess I'm trying to say. But we will check it with a level and do what we can to see if we can get it. I mean, trees aren't perfectly plumb. Mostly, I don't want to be so wildly out that it's quite either bad looking and obvious, but more importantly, um, awkward to use because it's not perfectly balanced and not stacked perfectly on the wheels if it gets too out of whack, which most of these is why I stood them here, just to kind of get it at a glance. And you can just see the gap as it closes. It's quite normal and so being factory ended like that they ought to stand up real nice and even these they'll stand on that factory end but they've had a little bit these biggest ones are just so heavy um that they sit there kind of oblong and stuff they're going to take a little bit of massaging to get them right but they'll come in correctly then where will we be we'll need some angle brace brackets on the outside and so because we have, I don't know how exactly to illustrate this. So, at least on the smallest sizes, because we've got to have a steel brick in here, basically from the face of the pot to the face of the pot, and sitting on some kind of a cleat that might even obscure this hole, so it sits like that, we haven't got anywhere to put an L bracket in that isn't in the way to hold this tube upright, unless we're on top of the pot. So in these cases where the pots come right up through the outer wall of the tube, we'll be right on top of it with the L bracket, and we'll go right up the side of the tube, and we'll screw right through the tube with construction screws right into 2 by 4 blocks, which will give us some nice bite. And then through these lower holes and into the top of these aluminum pots, we'll use self-tapping screws into the aluminum, which ought to do a nice job if we're careful. Um, and it really... That's temporary. More, more importantly, when we start blending from this shape up onto the tube with strips of cardboard, and we get all of, it's basically a loft that we're doing. We're lofting this surface shape back to the perfect circle by using vertical strips of cardboard all kind of slung at the same sort of kind of curve. And they'll be at the bottom, they'll be in the crotch, and we'll continue to add them on to the top until the highest points strips are on top of everybody and it kind of like shingles around. I'm picturing in my head, there still might be some air gaps, but that's going to get coated with wood glue or otherwise hardened and maybe even some paper towel or something, turned into a very complicated, complex curve shape, and that will become the one giant gusset that holds the tube perfectly normal at 90 degrees to the surface of the floor, and thereby those angle brackets in there will become kind of unnecessary, but uh, they're easy enough to put in prior to that other operation, and they won't hurt anything, and I think it's just a bit, I mean, they're just a couple of dollars, so I think it's quite professional. And um, oh, what else? Oh, so with these wheels, notice the base is a rectangle of steel, and so because of the location of the screw holes in this bracket and because the bracket of the pan will be sitting into the tube the bracket's going to start out here i may even have to bend this over the corner i was hoping not to have to do that but the point is i wanted the rectangle in here this way like the long aspect like that so i was sure to avoid the bearing circle I was looking at that carefully. I guess they're not plotted out here. But anyway, I'm trying not to get the other end of the self-tapping screw to come straight through and jam into the bearing of the caster wheel because that'll screw up its function. So we'll have to watch that. And so it just means that, like, I've been drawing a line from the outer point of the circle to the center of these shapes and trying to put these rectangular plates at 90 degrees to it. Like that. Like that. Like that over there. See that? And if you're not careful, when I went the first time I actually glued this up, I had them cockeyed and I had to carefully change it before the glue hardened. Lots of moving parts here. Lots of what seems like 
you know, tracing and doing rework, but all this pattern making, and now this is all data. And these patterns, I'll slap a sticker on them, I'll take them home and hang them on the wall, but uh, between either renting these trees out or, you know, building more in the future, this layout and pattern creation and all of that is intellectual property, basically. It's IP. Um, to watch this video, it'd be a huge help, I think, to make a set of these. But I have, if I haven't given you these dimensions and stuff, it'd be a bit of head scratching and a bit of, you know, puzzling and farting around. So, and I'm not holding that over anyone's head. I'm just saying that these will be nice to have going forward. And this is the type of thinking that you want to have when you're working. So, all right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you.